The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the Gordian Knot of Time Travel Paradox Cut with specially sharpened bacon slices. Is there anything bacon can't do? Well, probably shouldn't attempt to fight other bacon to the death. That's what created the big black hole at the center of the Milky Way in the first place, say bacon scientists. Plus, we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. When the late great science fiction legend Jerry Pornell passed away, he left an almost completed manuscript for the next book in the Janissary series. Jerry Pornell called that book Mamelukes. Well, with 80% of it done and a clear outline for completion, his son Philip Pornell decided to take on the task of completing it, along with Honor Harrington creator David Weber. We talk with David Weber and Philip Pornell about completing Mamelukes, about the work of Jerry Pornell, and about this great science fiction adventure novel. This is the second part of the interview. Plus, more David Weber greatness as we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Now here's the news. The mighty June mass markets are thundering to booksellers everywhere. This also means that the ebook prices drop on these books, by the way. Out in June is To Clear Away the Shadows by David Drake. The crew of the good ship Far Traveler have been tasked with cataloging the new life forms they encounter on their journey through sponge space. The crew of the Far Traveler is poised to clear more of the shadows away from the deep past than ever before in human history, if they survive. Also out in June in mass market is The Remarkable Witchy Kingdom by D.J. Butler. A taxing encounter with her father's goddess has not turned out to be the end for Sarah Penn. Now with the imperial fist tightened around her city of Cahokia, she must find a way to access the power of the serpent throne itself, a feat that her famous father never accomplished. But Sarah may have what it takes to do it and defeat the evil necromancer Oliver Cromwell. Finally out now in mass market paperback edition is Mark of Cain by Charles E. Gannon. Cain Riordan must blaze a trail through dying and dangerous worlds to find his beloved, Elena Corcoran. Riordan also finds that the Dornani collapse has not only been engineered, but is the prelude to a far more malign scheme to clear a path for a foe bent on destroying the earth. Mark of Cain by Charles E. Gannon, Witchy Winter by D.J. Butler, and To Clear Away the Shadows by David Drake are all out in mass market editions at booksellers everywhere. Check them out. This is part two of a multi-part interview with Philip Pornell and David Weber discussing Mamelukes by the late Jerry Pornell. Part three will be available on next week's podcast. I want to welcome David Weber and Philip Pornell to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. We're doing all right, considering. Um, David Weber, as uh, most everyone knows, is um, has got about 8 million copies of his books in print, 30 titles, or probably more on the New York Times bestseller list by now. Um, creator of the uh, Honor Harrington series, the, the that Oath of Swords fantasy series, um, multiverse series, just lots and lots of uh, stuff out from Bain and elsewhere. Um, and what was the last thing? Oh, you know, the, uh, the next thing that's going to be up from David is going to be the Valkyrie Protocol, which is the, um, the sequel to the Gordian Protocol, which he's been doing with Jacob Hollow. We'll hope to talk about that soon, too. Um, Philip Pornell is, um, Philip, tell me, uh, I was, I was struggling to find your bio 
and uh, maybe you could just fill me in on that. Uh, sure. So uh, I spent 26 years in the uh, Navy uh, as a surface warfare officer, meaning I drove and fought ships. Uh, I also was uh, had the uh, privilege of going to the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, got a master's degree in operations analysis, which I used uh, when I had alternating tours between the Pentagon and the fleet. Um, so in the fleet, I served on cruisers, destroyers, amphibious ships, and uh, high-speed vessel, experimental high-speed vessel, and then on in the Pentagon, I served on the Navy staff, and then on the uh, OSD uh, um, capabilities assessment uh, program evaluation, uh, and also uh, three year, or five years at the Austin assessment, um, where I was doing uh, war gaming, modeling simulation, and other types of analysis. And um, you're at, what is net assessment anyway? So net assessment is the uh, Secretary of Defense's uh, internal think tank and tasked with looking out 30 years into the future and uh, diagnosing what the future uh, security environment would, would be. Um, it had a legendary uh, director, uh, uh, Mr. Marshall, uh, Mr. Andrew Marshall, uh, who, who led it for several years before he retired and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and he was the one who identified when the Soviet Union was going to fall and why and identified uh, China as the uh, 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 probable uh, threat after that. So he was very prescient and uh, uh, in many respects, the task of the Austin assessment is to write really hard science fiction. And they've done uh, remarkably well in terms of um, diagnosing future security environments. And one of the key tools we uh, use there was uh, wargaming. It sounds like super cool. How how long were you there? I was there for five years uh, until I retired from the Navy. And then for the last uh, uh, three and a half years, I've been uh, a, a contractor. I was originally with a company called Launcher Strategy Group, working through the Austin Assessment, and now I'm at a company called uh, Group W, uh, where I do uh, analysis and wargaming. That's cool. You are also, um, and what we what we want to talk about today is is uh, a new book, which is out of booksellers everywhere. This is Mamelukes by Jerry Pornell, who was your dad. Um, and you know Jerry Pornell was a was one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time, um, master of military science fiction, creator of the the Falkenberg series and um, Janus series, Exiles to Glory, High Justice. These are things that Bain put out, King David's Spaceship, um, and uh, had those great bestsellers with Larry Niven, Lucifer's Hammer, The Moat in God's Eye, Footfall. Um, in addition to that, you know, we've talked about this on the podcast, Jerry, you and uh, I and your brother before and John Carr. Um, Jerry Pornell, Dr. Jerry Pornell was a polymath who held advanced degrees in psychology, statistics, engineering, political science. And all of these fields, he, you know, it wasn't just uh, show degrees. I mean, he was also actively involved in all of this as well. So um, an amazing man. And um, so there was a manuscript when he passed away um there was there were several i think uh but this is this is the thing that he was uh just about done with can you let's talk about that before we dive into the story and such um what how'd you find this what happened how do we know this was here so uh dad had been working on mammaloops for several years and he, of course, had some uh, health issues over the years. He, there was a growth in his head. I think it was cancer, but we don't, never know for certain. And uh, they had to treat it with uh, um, hard radiation to uh, uh, remove it. And that moved him from the uh, superhuman status where he would churn out all this work, not only the books, but the uh, uh, View from Chaos Manor and all the other uh, work he did. And it made him merely human. So it slowed him down uh, by comparison considerably. And then uh, later he had a stroke. So um, after he'd recovered from the stroke, he had gone back into trying to finish uh, uh, Mamelukes. And uh, I'd had many conversations with him over the years about uh, you know what he was working on and where he wanted to go. And he you know 
And like many of his stories, uh, or many of the other stories in the Janissary series, it was the book that just couldn't be finished. There was just so many opportunities, and it just kept expanding. So he, uh, he assessed that the book was about 80% done, and then unfortunately uh, uh, he passed away, and uh, the book that um, you know was, was initially unfinished, uh, but it was 80% done, so I... Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a great story, and it needed to be finished. And so uh, I talked to Tony uh, 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 Weisskopf and said, I, you know, I'd like to help uh, finish this, but uh, I'm obviously going to need some help. And uh, uh, I think uh, David can, can uh, finish out the story from that perspective. Well, I was... Uh... I was in your offices in North Carolina uh, for a convention, uh, I guess two or three years ago now, um, and uh, Tony and I were talking, and I said, you know, there, are, uh, I'm getting to a point in life where it is obvious that I am not going to have enough time to finish all of the storylines that, that I wanted to tell. And she was like, yeah, you're not going to live forever. I'm like, Thank you, Tony. You make me feel so much better. Um, but um, I, we were talking about unfinished storylines, and I said, you know, there are two that I always wanted to actually be involved with, and one of them was uh, Piper's Lord Calvin, and I said the other was Jerry's Jerry's Janissary series. And she said, oh, you you would have liked to have worked in the Janissaries universe? And I said, yeah, she said, Aha, "Have I got a deal for you?" <laughs> so that's how I got um, involved. Um, and for me, it was very, very much um, a labor of love. Yeah. Well, as we start, all right. So we've got. Uh, there's just been a major battle won, and and Rick's forces have um, have contributed. Maybe you know he's pretty much made it possible. And um, there is a uh, there's a ruler named Ganton, and there is this consortium called the Five Kingdoms. Uh, Rick is part of Drantos. Uh, T- can you just talk about the political mess that we find ourselves in, and the in the interesting balance that that's going on here at the start of the book? Ganton's mother was from the Five Kingdoms, and so that had established uh, some precedence initially for why the Five Kingdoms invaded Drantos in the first book, which created the whole situation. Uh, um, so when Rick defeats the forces of the Five Kingdoms in Drantos in the first book, he sets himself up as a uh, essentially a count in the uh, political system of Drantos. Well, now, uh, in the, in the uh, Storms of Victory, the heir of the Five Kingdoms appears to be dead, and uh, there's the possibility then that the uh, new heir, via the um, female side, uh, would be um, Ganton. Now, there are also some other uh, uh, characters out there that have some claims to the throne, and there is supposed to be some form of an election but uh, traditionalists usually go with whoever's the apparent heir. But this all opens up the possibility of Ganton becoming the king of the of, uh, the high king of the five kingdoms, reuniting uh, um, Drantos with the five kingdoms like years ago. Oh, by the way, his uh, uh, Ganton's son is also the uh, uh, grandson of the emperor of Rome because Ganton's wife. Uh, is the um, uh, granddaughter of the uh, of the emperor? So this opens up a, quite a range of uh, political um, entitlements, but of course, all those entitlements have to be backed up by force. Uh, and I'll let take it, yeah. David take it from there. Well, I think um, that's okay. Once upon a time, Drantos was part of the Five Kingdoms. Uh, which is what Phil was talking about uh, with reunifying them. Um, 
essentially, okay, uh, Ganton also was, uh, is in effect uh, the foster son of Rick's wife, Tylara. Um, she was the, her, her first husband, uh, was uh, the the most powerful noble in in Drantos, and he held out. He he was prepared to fight uh, for Ganton's claim to the throne. Uh, he died. Tylara held the the fortress, uh, the, the, the 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 county of Chelm, uh, in Ganton's name until uh, she surrendered ill-advised by one of her her uh, Drantos nobles. She herself was not born in Drantos. She is from uh, Term- Termathia, uh, which is sort of a bunch of Welsh longbowmen living in the hills uh, who are sort of between the empire and, and Drantos. Um, anyway, she eventually surrendered. She was brutally raped by the uh, pretender to the throne. Uh, she uh, escapes. Uh, she meets Rick during her escape, and Rick takes her home to her father's people, uh, which is where his real power base begins to evolve uh, in, in Termathia. And he introduces uh, uh, gunpowder and pike uh, warfare. Um, in order for the clans to survive. And ultimately, he takes back Chelm for Tylara and in the process uh, kills the, uh, most of the mercenaries who have, gone, who have gone over to the other side. It's complicated. It's very much worth reading the first two or three books to get it all nailed down. But where I was headed with this is that Ganton has what you might call a complicated relationship with Rick and Tylara, in part because of the threat that they represent to the traditional nobility in Drantos. Uh, the, the method of warfare that Rick is introducing will make the political system that justifies maintaining these feudal lords and whatnot obsolete, uh, and some of them are smart enough to realize it. So Ganton is under a great deal of pressure by his from his barons. Uh, he is also a young man uh, just out of his teens uh, who was raised, really, by Rick and, and Tylara for the last, what, six, seven years of his minority before he, before he assumed the throne in his own right. So he has that, I have to establish my independence thing going on. Um, and so Rick finds himself, Rick and Tylara find themselves in a very complicated situation in terms of their relationship with Ganton and what he's going to feel compelled to do to placate his barons because it was the barons turning against his father which cost his father his life and uh, almost got Ganton killed. Um, so there's there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff going on that poor old Rick and Tylara have to, have to balance. And in the middle of all this, Rick and Tylara in the last book and a half before this one were estranged because Tylara, being the Machiavellian soul that she is, uh, had uh, recruited an entire army of child assassins um, trained out of out of uh, war orphans and whatnot, uh, and was using them um, not capriciously at all, but she was using them in sort of medieval real politic and not telling Rick about it, and Rick found out about it anyway. Um, and so there was how can we really trust each other? Uh, there were a lot of issues going on. And those got re- those got resolved at the very end of the book before Mamelukes, but they helped to inform some of the problems that are still being dealt with in Mamelukes. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Rick is... But his... But his, his main... 
objective through all this. This is what he's got to do is is the fact is that the time is coming that this this third star is going to show up and the sky demons, the this other alien race that will probably wipe out a, a bunch of um, people are, are going to show up. And he needs to be ready for that. So he's got to make the decision that will best lead to everybody on Tran being ready for that. Good. Well, he's, that he's a good. Yeah, he, he's got, he, he's got he a, has. Yeah, he has a plan in <laughs> mind for all that, um, and it's going to be difficult enough as it is. But then some newcomers show up, and things get uh, yeah, get wonky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the first third of the book is this, and there's also the religious wars, which I'd like you to talk about. A little well, bit well, too, okay. But. I I would I. One of the one of the focuses of this book, of, of all the books, one of the focuses of Rick's life is that he has this plan, he has this strategy that is the best he's been able to work out for the survival of Tran and the humans on it. But first he has to survive to execute the strategy. And so he's got kind of that, uh, that uh, it's a little hard to uh, keep your eye on the ball when you're clubbing the alligators as they crawl out of the swamp after you uh, is definitely something that is is going on for him here. Um, yeah, um, religious wars. Okay. Like, like Yatar and Christ, they talk about a lot. And there's Christianity in this on track. Yes, yeah, there so, are Christians. Yeah. Go, Phil. So this is where where uh, uh, geopolitics and religion uh, meet, and you, you know you can have different theories on this. But when Rick lands in Drant's house and in Tamarthon, the main religion is regarding uh, basically Zeus. I mean, there's a local name for him, but it's a, a sky god, and there's there's kind of a pantheon. Uh, um, r- r- the Biggest one of those is a Vothon, which is uh, would probably be Odin uh, when when uh, you know translated. So uh, you have Zeus and, and Odin in different forms, and uh, then there's also a, a local fertility goddess, and then um, you know they have this uh, engagement with the Romans. The Romans are the enemy, and then they defeat them, and then they become friends, and then suddenly the Pope has this vision that the local goddess of fertility um, in, was incarnated as Mary to give birth to Christ, who also has the powers of both on. And so you have this united church that springs up in the center between um, the Roman Empire and Drantos, but it is um, not as well held further north, where it's more Germanic, and uh, uh, folks are more aligned with the uh, uh, Bothon, um, and this creates all sorts of, uh, of issues, not to mention the separate brands of Christianity, both in the South, in the Sunlands, and in uh, the, uh, um, uh, the the Republic the sitting out off the coast. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. the, the, the well, Empire the... has its own form of Christianity, and then, and then off the coast uh, um, uh, the... Um, the the Nikesians have their I yeah it's it's kind of it's it's almost uh, Greek Orthodox and and Roman it's not exactly the same distinctions but it's the, it's those different flavors of of Christianity between between the Empire and the Republic one thing that I think needs to be added in, into the mix is that the the uh religious leaders in Drantos uh are the keepers of the caverns of the protector the protector is a native uh tree whose roots uh produce uh ammonia and it's a it's a natural refrigeration it's a Apparently, it's a survival mechanism for the trees uh, to keep their roots cooled uh, when the uh, when the time comes and the, and the planetary temperature rises. Well, uh, caverns under these these trees are naturally refrigerated, and so they are where where food supplies are supposed to be stored for the time. And the priesthood is the the keeper of these of these caverns. 
So they have been uh, very much associated with keeping the lifeboat afloat for a long time uh, on, on Tran. And all of this is, is stirred together in the, uh, the, the social and religious mechanisms um, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the planet. It's, it's a delightfully complex uh, brew um, that I just have this vision of Jerry sitting at his typewriter in pre-computer days with this big grin on his face as he's, as he's working away on, what headache shall I give Rick next? Ah, I have it. <laughs> and the great thing about Rick is a agnostic uh, in the face of it. I mean, he's an honest agnostic to, 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 to himself. He has to, a uh, feign interest in the local religious politics in order to keep uh, things stable. But he's also very moral. Uh, yes. And so he's very worried that uh, if he tips things one way or the other uh, religiously, he's going to have uh, religious uh, wars. And he really, really doesn't want that blood on his hands in addition to all the other uh, things that he's accidentally or to some degree had to purposefully uh, do. He's got enough blood on yeah. his hands as it is. He doesn't want to add that. Yeah, and he's a man who feels this um, this blood. Hang on, hang, hang on a second, Tony. Phil just said sure. something that I think I think I really want to go back to the very first book uh, for a minute here. Uh, one of the things that impressed me about this book when I read it for the first time, when the mercenaries are transported to Trant, Phil was talking about the fact that there's a mutiny. What happens is that uh, Rick is is the senior officer of the surviving mercenaries, um, and his second in command is a guy named Andre Parson, uh, who is probably ex French Legion and a couple of things. And Rick is an ROTC college boy. Okay, he was a track star. He's not real sure why he volunteered to do this, except it was his, you know, his patriotic duty, etc. Uh, when we talk about mercenaries here, in Rick's case, we need to be clear that this is not some hardened uh, mercenary guy who's been doing this for twenty years. This is a college kid uh, who is a ROTC graduate who was was doing his best. Okay, so he winds up and on he, this planet. He, 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 his objective in life was to be a history professor. Yes, which is very handy for him where he winds up. But um, Parsons doesn't think he has what it takes to to pull this mission off in this, you know, really, you know, rotten area. So he basically wants to kill Rick and take over. But the senior non-coms, they're willing to go along with letting him take command, but they like Rick, so he gets to leave. He gets to take his personal weapons, and one of them, Art Mason, a corporal, uh, one of the non-coms, volunteers to go with him and kind of watch his back. Um, so I, Parsons then pursues his uh, idea of how this should work, which is – go ahead and be brutal and burn down villages and whatever. Um, he takes the side of the five kingdoms invading Drantos because they look like the winning side. Rick winds up on the other side. But there's something that Gwyn says. Gwyn uh, Tremaine is uh, another character from Earth who was less... We, we were talking earlier about Les, one of the Janissaries. Um, he is the pilot who delivers Rick and company to Tran, and he and Gwen become lovers, and Gwen has his child. She stays behind on Tran because if she had continued to accompany him, the Confederacy would have insisted on aborting their child. Anyway, um, he tells he knows that Andre is already plotting against Rick before they ever get to Tran. He pretty sure that Rick is going to leave, and Gwen chooses to go with Rick rather than to stay with, with Parsons. But she says to him later, when he wins, she says, you know, I had never thought about this, but ethics as a survival mechanism, 
in essence, the thing that allows Rick to survive, and I really admire the way Jerry did this, one of the things that allows Rick to survive throughout this book is that he is not only prepared to fight hard, he's not only prepared to make the sacrifices, etc., 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 but he is an ethical, not just a moral, but an ethical man. He not only knows what is right, he insists on doing what is right as much as he possibly can. And what this means is that even people who are his enemies know that his word is good and that he is trustworthy. And in the midst of this snake pit that he's been thrown into, It is that integrity which is the key to putting him in a position of trust that is central to almost all the major power groups. Do you see what I'm saying? And having... Yeah, and also makes him a it makes him a fun character for the reader to identify with because he's he's not a you know he's he's not a, a implacable sort of fellow he feels what he's doing he feels this way um, yet at the same time he's very proactive that's the thing that i really like it's like he his way forward is usually by taking the offensive in some way he just thinks about it well he almost he almost has to there's there's a character in in the book who's introduced into the storyline in this one uh who basically says uh look you know, I'm a soldier. He's talking to Rick. He says, I'm a soldier, and you're not. But you're something more important than being a soldier. You're a commander. Okay? And I think that is really the essence of 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 Rick. Um, you're right when you say that he's proactive. I think, I think rather than thinking of his approach to problems as being offensive – because he would rather not fight another war in his entire life. I think I think you're right that proactive is probably a, a, a better word. He yeah. well, he doesn't he doesn't hole up um, and and wait for <laughs> things to happen. So. Okay, there's Rick. Remember, I mean not Rick, Phil. Sorry, <laughs> Phil. Remember the the scene where um, uh, Baker is talking to his subordinates and he's talking about uh they they they're saying I thought he'd be harder to convince than that and baker says to his, says to his own subordinate you, we're not going to tell you who baker is I don't think because if we told you who baker is we'd have to tell you about the gurkhas so we're not going to tell you about the gurkhas but anyway um baker is saying to his subordinates you know look this man has been on this planet for like 20 20 years, and he's still alive, and he's still moving forward. Do you think that was just an accident, a coincidence, more or less? Um, And I think that sums Rick up um, in in a lot of ways. He is a command, he's he's a thinker, and he's a moral man, and he's an ethical man. And all of those combine to drive him to do things that are destroying him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Simply the, because the, the he, Romans, the Romans, uh, or you know, ancient Romans before before Christianity would say that he, you know, uh, uh, Rick is a, a character in a saga of God, you know, being tortured by the gods, uh, uh, and yeah. he is a he is a very moral man, and as I said before. Um, he he wants as little blood on his hands as he can, but but there is blood on his hands. There was no way to get around yeah. get around it. So he's he's trying to do the best he can to uh, yeah. to have as little blood on his hand, and he's burdened with the knowledge of uh, trying to make humanity survive, not only on Tran, but possibly uh, uh, a you know, larger issue. And and he has to do it in a way that doesn't leave footprints for the Shelnuxi to follow him by, if you follow me. If he's going to survive on Tran, if he's going to preserve a kernel of knowledge that humanity can use going forward, etc., he has to figure out a way to do that 
that the Shalnexi won't be able to take out uh, when they leave. And there's not any way you can do it. There's not any way you can do it in a way that they can't destroy before they leave. He has to do it in a way that causes them to not feel to to feel that they have destroyed it when they haven't. If you see what I'm saying. Uh, so, like for example, he's using one one of his uh, centers where he's growing madweed. It's basically a target. This is as he he wants the Shalnuxi to think. Okay, this is his base of operations. This is where all of his advanced knowledge is going to be. So they'll take out that target when they get ready to leave. And meanwhile, he's going to try and disperse knowledge and so forth to other areas of the planet. Um, yeah. well, it's one of the more uh, interesting. It, it, it's one of the more in, interesting uh, conundrums that somebody's handed to a character in science fiction. I think um, the 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 it's it's the Tran is Tran is a microcosm compared to a, some of the you know the big sprawling series because it's most of the action is happening on one planet. Now that may change a little bit going forward but right this minute we're, we're really focused in on tran and yet it's an incredibly complex situation um because you have to you gotta um you want to advance but you can't you can't like be showing it to uh, these aliens who are coming who could wipe you out with a with a look yeah, basically what Jerry managed to do is to create a situation in which every single thing that Rick is trying to do, somebody's trying to kill him to stop him from doing it. And if he does it wrong, they'll wipe out the planet. No stress, no pressure. Yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. That was part two of a multi-part interview with Philip Pornell and David Weber discussing Mamelukes by the late, great Jerry Pornell. Part three will be available on next week's podcast. Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Solarian League. For hundreds of years they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has worn the star kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. Harrington House, City of Landing, Planet of Manticore, Manticore Binary System. Honor! Dr. Allison Harrington's smile was huge as Duchess and Steadholder Harrington entered the Harrington House foyer with Spencer Hawk and Clifford McGraw at her heels. Corporal Anastasia Yanikov, Allison's personal armswoman, nodded respectfully to Major Hawk and then smiled as she watched Allison throw her arms about her daughter. Honor Alexander Harrington hugged her back, fighting the reflex urge to bend at the knees so she didn't tower over her diminutive mother quite so badly. She'd managed to break that habit about the time she turned 16, but the reflex still asserted itself from time to time, especially when her mother was pregnant. Mother, she replied a bit more sedately, then stood back with her hands on Allison's shoulders. There have been some changes, I see she added, looking down at her mother's abdomen. You could have mentioned something about this, oh, a month or so ago. I suppose I could have. Allison smiled up at her. On the other hand, dear, 
while I wouldn't want to call you unobservant or anything of the sort, it did seem to me that giving you the opportunity to improve the acuity with which you view the universe might not be out of order. I see. Honor shook her head as Corporal Yanikov smiled and Major Hawk and Sergeant McGraw found somewhere else to look. We do seem to have these little moments without proper warning, though, don't we? At least in my case, I knew I could get pregnant, Allison observed with a devilish smile, watching Hawk and McGraw from the corner of one eye. Then her expression sobered. Although, to be honest, I had to think long and hard about deactivating my implant. Her lips trembled ever so slightly. It was hard for your father. For me too, I guess. But losing that many people we loved. She shook her head, the eyes which matched honors dark. It was almost like we couldn't decide whether we were reaffirming that life went on, creating the additional child we'd discovered we wanted, especially after Faith and James were born, or trying to replace the ones we loved. It was that last bit that made it hard. It felt almost disloyal somehow. In the end, though, we just said the hell with any philosophical questions. And I'm glad you did. Honor hugged her close again. To be honest, if I had the time, I think Hamish, Emily, and I would be doing exactly the same thing. For all the reasons you just listed, really. And why shouldn't we? Her embrace tightened for a moment. Life does go on. We do want more kids. And we are creating more people to put into the holes in our hearts. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see an uptick in births all across the system, but especially on Sphinx. She released her mother and smiled sadly. It's one of the things that happen in wars. Well, on that topic, Allison said in a brighter tone, I happen to think it's time you provided me with additional grandchildren. Not that Raoul and Catherine aren't perfectly satisfactory, you understand. There's a certain security in numbers, though. And while I realize you're busy at the moment, Emily's available. Mother, you're incorrigible. Honor laughed and shook her head. And, to be honest, I think Emily may be thinking in that direction, too. Her smile turned warm. Hamish and I will never be able to thank you enough for getting her past that particular block. Even if I was pushy, insufferable, and meddlesome? No, were you really? Honor gazed at her in astonishment. I didn't realize. I thought you were just being your normal self. She paused a beat. Oh, that's what you meant, wasn't it? It's really a pity I never believed in corporal punishment, Allison observed, then grinned as her daughter giggled. Mother, I wouldn't change you even if I could, Honor said then. Which, thank God, nobody in the universe would be capable of in the first place. Nimitz bleaked in amusement and nodded his head in emphatic agreement with that statement. Well, I certainly hope not, Allison said serenely, tucking her daughter's hand into her elbow and leading the way towards the private family section of Harrington House. Their bodyguards fell in astern like escorting destroyers. And thank you for letting us use the house tonight, Allison continued as they started up the magnificent winding staircase. We really appreciate it. Mother... This is your and dad's house now, a lot more than it's mine. I believe I've told you that no more than, oh, five or six thousand times. It's got more rooms than most hotels, and as long as Hamish, Emily, and I have a modest little six or seven room suite in which to hang our berets, I think we can consider our housing needs adequately met whenever two or three of us happen to be in landing at the same time, which unfortunately isn't happening all that often just now. I understand that. No, really, I do. Allison waved her free hand as Honor bent a skeptical eye upon her. But it's also Steadholder Harrington's official residence and Harrington Steading's embassy in the Star Empire. Under the circumstances, I don't think we should be throwing any drunken orgies without clearing it with you first. Your very own drunken orgy? How exciting! Are Hamish and I invited? Something very like a smothered chuckle escaped one of the Graysons behind her. No, dear, Allison patted her hand. The drunken orgy is private after the party. I was only using it as an example. Darn, and I was so looking forward to it. I see Hamish and Emily have been good for the Beowulf side of you, Allison said, 
and Nimitz laughed again, then raised his right hand, fingers closed to spell the letter S, and nodded it up and down in agreement. I'll admit they've helped me face my inner Beowulf, Honor acknowledged. It's even possible the rest of the universe will forgive them for that, someday. Music drifted from the quintet of live musicians in the corner of the ballroom. The night was warm and clear, so the crystalplast wall had been retracted, extending the ballroom out across the terrace and increasing its normal 600 square meters of floor space by a third. For the present, that additional floor space was unavailable for dancing, however. Instead, spotless white tablecloths fluttered on the land breeze blowing outward across Jason Bay, while the Harrington House staff augmented for the evening prepared to serve supper. Nor was anyone dancing in the ballroom itself, despite its size, the splendor of its brilliantly polished marble floor, and the invitation of the music. Possibly because the music in question was a bit odd by Manticoran standards. Allison and Alfred Harrington had fallen in love with classical Grayson music during their time on Grayson, but the planet's ancient dancing traditions, which centered on something called the square dance, weren't familiar to most Manticorans. The lack of dancers was subject to change, however, and Honor suspected that it would after dinner. At the moment, she stood between Hamish and Emily Alexander Harrington's life support chair, gazing out across the bay. Honor, I'd like you to meet someone, the voice said, and she turned as her father, one of the few people present who was actually taller than she was, walked up behind her. Since Harrington House was technically Grayson soil, and Honor tended to dress in her persona as Steadholder Harrington whenever she was officially home, she wasn't in uniform tonight. But her father, for the first time since her childhood, was. Rather than the four golden pips of his pre-retirement rank, however, his collar bore two gold platelets. A single broad gold band had been added to the three bands of a commander, and the unit patch on his left shoulder showed the rod of Asclepius under the word Bassingford. In the newly reactivated Commodore Harrington's case, both the staff itself and the single serpent were embroidered in gold, rather than the silver of other Bassingford Medical Center shoulder flashes. Which was rather the point of this evening's festivity, she reflected. Her father hadn't simply gone back onto active duty. Effective tomorrow, he was Bassingford's 103rd commanding officer. Officially, that was because he'd been recalled by the Navy, and that was fair enough because the Navy had wanted him back at Bassingford virtually from the day he retired and resigned his post as head of neurosurgery. In reality, though, it was the Yawada strike which had returned him to active duty. He'd needed a few months to make up his mind. The process had begun shortly after the strike, but it had taken the Battle of Spindle and especially Operation Raging Justice to complete it. One thing was sadly obvious. If the Mandarins persisted in their current policies, Bassingford would need far more beds, most of which would be filled by Solarians. Alfred Harrington needed to be part of dealing with all those broken bodies and lives. That was what had finally pushed him back into uniform. That and the need to do something healing, rather than succumb to the part of him which had once been Sergeant Harrington, Royal Manticoran Marine Corps. Now he smiled at his daughter, indicating the much shorter woman, no more than 15 or 16 centimeters taller than Allison Harrington, at his side. She had dark hair, 10 or 12 centimeters longer than Honor had once worn her own, dark eyes, and a lively, mobile face. She too was in uniform with the Bassingford shoulder flash, although in her case, only the staff of the rod was in gold. Honor, this is Captain Sarah Kate Lessam, Alfred said. Sarah Kate? My daughter, Duchess Harrington, she's- Sarah Kate! Honor smiled broadly and enveloped the shorter woman in a hug. Uh, should I assume my introduction was a bit superfluous? Her father asked after a moment while Hamish and Emily chuckled. Daddy, I've known Sarah Kate for, what, 30 T years, Sarah Kate? I'm afraid it really has been about that long, Captain Lessam replied with a smile. It's good to see you again, though. It's been too long. I'm sorry I missed the wedding, Honor said, shaking her head. I was occupied at the time. You mean you were off blowing things up again, Captain Lessam observed. Well, yes, I suppose, Honor smiled. And how do you like being a respectable married woman? Honor, it's been three T years now, 
How do you expect me to remember what it was like before? And speaking of respectable married women, Captain Lessam raised her eyebrows in Hamish and Emily's direction, and Honor chuckled. Mom and Dad really did teach me better manners than that, she said. Sarah Kate, this is my husband, Hamish Alexander Harrington, and this is my wife, Emily Alexander Harrington. Both of them have long, tiresome lists of titles we'll leave to one side right now. Hamish, Emily, this is Sarah Kate Lessam. I first met her when she was Sarah Kate Tillman. They have long, tiresome lists of titles? Captain Lessam shook her head, then shook hands with both of Honor's spouses. At least half of which come from our association with her, Emily told her with a smile. May I ask how you and Honor come to know one another? Uncle Jacques introduced us, Honor replied before Lessam could, and it was her father's eyebrows turned to rise. Jacques introduced you, he said. Wait a minute. Would this have anything to do with those anachronisms of his? Of course it does. Sarah Kate's another member of the society. Her particular interest is in what they called ballroom dancing from the last couple of centuries anti-diaspora. It's not what most people do today. Actually, I like it a lot better. So, Sarah Kate, you're at Bassingford these days? I am, Lessam confirmed. She means she's the assistant director and head of nursing and physical therapy, Commodore Harrington put in. And I've had a lot more patience than I'd like since that business with Filaretta. Lessam's expression was much less cheerful than it had been. They may all be sollies, but a broken body's still a broken body. I know, Honor sighed, and I hate it. If I could have avoided it, if you could have avoided it, We'd be calling you God and lighting candles to you, Lessam interrupted. And if it had occurred to me that you were going to go off on a guilt trip, I never would have opened my mouth about it either. Oh, I like you, Captain Lessam, Emily said enthusiastically. Please, kick her again. Lessam gave her a startled glance, then snorted in sudden understanding. Been brooding about it, has she? Only sometimes, Emily replied in the judicious tone of someone trying to be scrupulously fair. Not more than every other time I see her. Then consider her kicked, Lessam promised. Oh, thank you both so much. Anna rolled her eyes while Hamish and her father chuckled. And you two aren't helping this, you know, she told the male component of the conversation severely. Not my responsibility to help when Captain Lessam and Emily are doing such a splendid job. Hamish informed her. Not that either of them's likely to tell you anything I haven't. Acknowledged, Honor nodded, and I'll try. Good, Lessam reached out to squeeze her upper arm gently. That's good, Honor. I see Mistress Thorne's minions are about ready to serve, Hamish observed, looking back towards the ballroom. Will you join us, Captain? I'd be honored, my lord. On social occasions, it's Hamish, Captain. Only if it's also Sarah Kate, my lord, Lessam replied a bit pointedly. Then would you join us, Sarah Kate? Thank you, Hamish. He smiled and offered her his arm while Honor took Emily's hand and the four of them headed for the head table. Alfred looked around until he located Allison. As usual, she was at the center of a cluster of admirers, most of them male, and he headed across to rescue her and escort her to the same table. She smiled happily as he swooped down upon her, ruthlessly exploiting his position as both husband and guest of honor, since the evening was the official announcement of his return to duty, and she tucked her hand into his elbow and squeezed gratefully as he led her away. I don't know what you were thinking to leave me exposed that way. Her tone was teasing, but there was an edge of seriousness to it. My God, Alfred! You didn't tell me we were inviting George Brockman. She shuddered. That man doesn't have the faintest concept of what monogamy means. And if I'd thought for a moment that you weren't perfectly capable of cutting him off at the knees or at any other appropriate point on his anatomy, I'd have been there in an instant, her husband assured her, and looked down at her with a faint twinkle. Tell me with a straight face that you didn't enjoy doing exactly that when as I'm sure happened, he gave you the chance. 
You may be able to throw me heartlessly to the wolves, but you can't make me lie. She lifted her nose with an audible sniff, then smiled wickedly. I'm pretty sure the bleeding will stop in another hour or so. Good for you, Alfred laughed. And while we're talking about social lapses, were you aware Honor and Sarah Kate Lessam and Jacques, now that I think about it, all know one another? Of course I was. She looked up at him again with a devilish smile. Dear me, did I forget to mention that to you? Out of consideration for your delicate condition, I will defer the proper response to that. Oh, no, you won't, she told him pertly. I've already had the peach preserves sent to our room. You're incorrigible, he said, smothering a laugh. I don't know why you and Anna keep saying that. I'm the most incorrigible person I know. It's good to see him laughing again, Emily Alexander Harrington said quietly, as her mother and father-in-law headed towards the table. Agreed, Honor said equally quietly. And I think... She paused for a moment, then shook her head. You think what? Emily pressed. Oh, it was just a passing thought. Honor shook her head again, her expression sobering. We're all having a few of those at the moment, I think. Yes, we are, Emily agreed, but she gazed at Honor speculatively. And Honor made herself look back with tranquil eyes as she tasted the curiosity in Emily's mind glow. She also didn't mention what had spawned that passing thought. Tell me, have you given any more thought to a brother or sister for Catherine and Raoul? She asked instead. I have, Emily nodded, although the question seemed to have sharpened the focus of that speculation Honor had tasted. In fact, I have an appointment to discuss it with Dr. Illescu at Briarwood tomorrow afternoon, before I go back to Whitehaven. Oh, good. Honor beamed at her, bending over her chair to envelop her in a gentle hug. I'm thinking about doing the same thing. Maybe this time we can time it even closer. There's only a month or so between the two we have, dear, Emily pointed out dryly. What, you want to synchronize the deliveries to the same minute? Well, if neither one of us is going to be in a position to do it the old fashioned way, we might as well take advantage of the opportunities we do have. Besides, she straightened with a devilish smile. Twins do run in mom's family, you know. Emily laughed and Honor's smile turned more gentle. But then she straightened and looked at Hamish across Emily's head. She swiveled her eyes to one side, to where Sandra Thurston, Emily's nurse and constant companion, stood chatting with James McGinnis while he kept an eagle eye on the evening's festivities. Her gaze came back to Hamish and he shrugged ever so slightly, letting an edge of worry show in his own blue eyes. Her mouth tightened as she put that together with the undertone she'd tasted in Emily's mind glow. But then she drew a deep breath. She wasn't going to borrow any trouble, she told herself firmly, not tonight. And not when all three of them had so much to be grateful for, including. You're right about how good it is to see Daddy laughing again, she said, looking back down at Emily and squeezing her good hand gently, then looked at Captain Lessam. I think it's going to be good for him to get back to work, too. Well, I can tell you the entire staff's damned glad we've gotten him back to work, Lessam said frankly. Lord knows we need him as a surgeon, but we need him even more on the administrative side. She shook her head. I wasn't joking about how many patients we're going to have on her. It's bad already, and if those idiots in old Chicago don't get their heads out of- She paused, then grimaced. Out of the sand, it's going to get a lot worse. I know. And we're trying to hold it to a minimum, Honor said, easing Nimitz off her shoulder to join Samantha in the double high chair between her and Hamish. And speaking of trying to keep things to minimums, where's Martin right now? I suppose, given your august connections, I can tell you, Lessam said, smiling crookedly at Hamish. At the moment, he's got a task group with Vice Admiral Correa. I don't know exactly where they were headed, but I know it's part of Leakawan too. If he's with Korea, he's probably in a J or Prime about now, Hamish said. And just between you and me, I'm a lot happier with the thought of his facing off with Sollies instead of Avonites, the captain observed. 
So am I, for now at least, Honor. I just wish we had a clue about some way to convince the Mandarins to at least pretend they have a single functional brain amongst them. I seem to sense just a little acerbity, Lessam teased. Just a bit, perhaps, Honor admitted. Tell me, Doctor, Sarah Kate, I mean, Emily said. Honor mentioned something about ancient ballroom dancing. How did you ever get involved with that? Blame it on my misspent youth, Lessam replied with a chuckle. That and the fact that my mother knew Honor's Uncle Jacques when they were college students. He got her involved with the Society for Creative Anachronisms, and she's a physical therapist too. Dance is sort of a natural connection for therapists, or it can be anyway. Fascinating. Emily shook her head. I've had quite a bit of experience with therapists myself over the years. But for fairly obvious reasons, no one ever suggested dance to me. I can see its applicability, though, now that you've mentioned it. Oh, I do it much more for pleasure than professionally, Lessam said. I even got Martin to take it up, and he's remarkably good at it. To be honest, I'm looking for a new challenge for him. You are, are you? Honor smiled. Well, in that case, you've come to the right place. I have? Lessam's eyebrows arched and Honor's smile grew broader. Oh, yes. Tell me, are you familiar with the phrase do si do? That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Bain intern Will Allen for editing help this time, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and the blinking brightness of a twinkling reef of space coral. Light years long, but only a micron thick, so don't look at it sideways or you'll put out your eye. Plus, thanks, praise, and gratitude to Philip Pornell and David Weber, who have completed Jerry Pornell's most excellent novel in the Janissary series, Mamelukes. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.